This is BTW RLM 307. That's right, we continue to be the crickets we're not supposed to be. And the fact is that that's the fact, and people are taking advantage of that. People who don't like you are taking advantage to take you down, and they do it so-called lawfully. And it's really just basic international law, so-called 101. And it has to do with occupations. It has to do with being able to secret yourself into a place and get everyone to agree that what's going on is what needs to go on. This is a method that we identified. Identify. I knew it a long time ago, but it took a while, quite a while, to set it up and finally get the facts through going and integrating with the legislative process one year in 2013 when the uh, legislature of a state was uh, hard against uh, the mining uh, law and the miners and the grantees is what they end up being. You call them miners, but they're actually a special class of grantee. And this is a very serious encroachment. But I won't in fact, I just got some news here. Know that some more, really, this last few weeks has really been some bad news for the United Nations, United States, based on implementation of UN agendas that either no one knows or everybody does, and not talking. And I just got some more news uh, against mining uh, that I'd wanted. To, I almost want to start talking about it, but it's just uh, off the top of my head. Probably won't be so smart to do. It won't be intelligent. Uh, it will be. It'll probably come out right, but you know, I've got to look at things. It's a dynamic that works in the world, and I've got to, I can't just come off the cuff sometimes. Uh, that to tell you folks that the, um, if you, I, I don't even know what to say much more. I, I just watch this major dysfunction in people. I don't care how, who they are, what they think they are. They, we can't get together. And uh, the fact of the lack of, of organization or dis, in the dysfunction and, and the lack of, uh, being able to take ourselves out of the picture and put a higher a higher need in our in place and work toward that is going to be our death. And it may be that some of us won't won't see it; we'll be gone. But there's um. I I, I don't even want to talk no more. There's just it's going to be a different nasty place to live, and I don't even know what what more to say about that. You know, all the dystopian things that you see may yeah, I might be Hollywood, but folks. It, it's it, there's going to be um, a pall on this earth that I don't think anybody can actually appreciate. And so I come every week to try and give you an, a line in on how to become functional again. I use what they call the news to do it, just as a literally just tabs on my board. I just read the, the new again. I can just typically read the the headline. Now this this today this first first report is not going to be just a headline. I'm going to lay out some stuff because it's good advice. If you want to start to learn to be functional, you have to learn the rules of the road. You have to learn what's happened and how your country is occupied, how you're an occupied people. A lot longer than a lot of people will uh, will understand. Uh, and neither here nor there, even if it just happened last week, uh, you have to come and respond. This is no different if we had, it'd be probably easier if we had Paul Revere and his lantern on a horse. Okay, that's I, w I was thinking last week. I wish we had something we could we could actually do to actually call people's attention. But you know, the more I look around, people could care less. People could actually care less. So, but I'm going to continue. I have to keep fighting myself actually because I look around and see no no response, and I, I can't do it myself. My colleagues can't do it themselves. And I can only tell you, it's not we're giving up. We Yeoman's work. Uh, I got a colleague who just put together a seminar and got a very good response. And my looking at it, I'm trying to guide this thing forward as well behind the scenes. Uh, I looked at it, a bunch of interested, integrated people, aware people, but they're completely dysfunctional in how they go about doing what they're supposed to do. They have, we, we as a society have no clue of what's how we've been transformed already. And so there's uh, clues on how to do this. There's ways to go about it. Uh, we have to re-engage. It's almost like the movie where you see the guy who has to be told by his coach or someone that loves him. You have to re-engage. Oh, it's Top Gun. That's what it was. you got to get the pilot to re-engage. You have to re-engage. You have to be told to do so because you're not you're stunned. You're not going to do it yourself. And that's how we are. We're like a society of stunned pilots. The fight was on. We we, we lost. We screwed up. And now we can't, now we got to be told to re-engage. We lost our We lost our will. 
we lost the, the responsibility. Now we're going to turn and fight it, uh, go to our, our mean, not mean as in bad, but our, our base level of response, which is really to do nothing. Just do nothing. And that's not how this game really works. And so, come here, I try to tell you, here, we got to respond. we got to get practiced in responding. I say, don't, if you don't have to, don't go to the criminal side. Don't become the criminal. Don't be made into a criminal. Why don't we learn how to do, deal with this on the administrative side? That's the prevalent, prevalent condition that we can do things and learn how to be more formal and more proper in our addressments and really start to do things that are not, don't bring jeopardy on us. And eventually they'll teach us what we need to know on the other side, which is the criminal or judicial side. The administrative is a little different, although I have found in the past, as I read through the rules of how you engage administrative, they're actually more, if you read the rules on how it works, they tell you all kinds of stuff on how, on what really due process is that you don't get on the judicial side. And so I find it's very formidable to do. Now you don't respond, and if the, those that ha offer the alternative that is transforming your life win. And we're just not, we're in like in this weird mode where some of us, most of us are not feeling that, that pinch. That, that time may be coming quickly here. We're going to be feeling lots of pinches. You're going to find out unless you take the, the mark, uh, whatever that is, uh, uh, whatever, the tattoo, the identity device, the unique identifier. You don't think your, if you don't think your phones is this tattoo. I saw Twitter. I ended up not, not responding. I'm getting tired of responding to people that are just, have a base ignorance about what's going on and don't see one can translate to another that a tattoo that they were complaining about was a, a, a tattoo to a cult that administer that advances pedophilia isn't the the phone that you got in your hands and if we don't learn to start translating these things as that the weapons against us we are uh, it doesn't matter what our complaints are it really won't matter your complaint will become something that needs to be weeded out, and they're going to have a whole lot of population control methodologies that are going to be available to you. If you don't think the New York, I mean, I'm just stunned at this one, the New York uh, abortion law now where you can be two seconds before birth and be killed, if you don't think this is where this is all going, I, I don't know. It's another quiver, another arrow in their quiver about how they're going to get rid of things that are do not uh, affect the the infrastructure of the new way to come, the third, the fourth way, whatever way they want to bring in, the way that isn't your way, and you're letting them. So there's a way to get at this. One of the people that I follow somehow, I don't even know how I follow, but I'm following them, and I don't like it, but I do anyway because it's important, it's necessary, uh, is an, uh, someone who who professes to be a scientist and educated and all this other stuff, and I'm just a, just appalled at what I see they think is real and what they'll what they'll move on forward and what they have to say, but they do they do have an organization, they do have an education, they have a schooling, I guess I can say, and they are starting to do a lot better. In other words, the people that are making, call themselves scientists, and these are all political lobbyists, and they don't even understand that. That's why I don't have a judgment against anybody. They really, people do not have an understanding of the dynamic, that uh, they are being, they are little pawns, and they use this uh, higher education, which is, you need to research what higher education is. Uh, higher education in order to justify their elite uh, view and then that's the way that's the best science and it's all political and it's all a fraud it's all not actually science and so but so these people now are organizing up and they're they're going to come and respond well i found in one of the pages that they bring a excellent example if you are so someone who wants to step up and not be in a jeopardy to do so and get a get back in the in the back into your jet fighter seat uh, they have a nice little uh, website uh, uh, presentation that I'd like to read off to you here, and it has a lot of the points that you need to know, and I, I don't care where I get the information. This is actually should be uh, known by everybody because this is what's being used against you right now to turn your way of life, and it's not going in the right direction. When I see the, the POTUS, so-called, the President of the United States, uh, making decisions, as I just saw uh, given to me on the Twitter that they want to make mining dis the national or regional mining districts to increase the permit uh, to decrease the permit times to get us back to mining critical minerals. I realize nobody knows what they're talking about there. Uh, that's a complete violation of law. And I don't. I just said that. I don't know if anybody of you know what I'm talking about. Those of you that might, um, thank you very much for paying attention. Uh, there's a very fundamental breach of fiduciary going on in this country, and it, it's not stoppable at this point. It's because of these kinds of things when you don't know what I'm going to read here and how to apply them 
and how they're being violated even when you know how that's how you, you don't figure out what has to be done you find out how it's not being done that's how you attack them this is really not a direct attack either and what you bring to the bear against all this stuff is literally the law that's written on the black and white and if you don't know how to do that you're toast you're, you're just you're toast at least that's my experience over the last 10 years if anybody will give me credit for that much support GM wheat trials Biology Fortified Incorporated. So now they're moving in to do GM wheat that they said they weren't doing. And we identified this behind the woodshed, all the stories that came out. Like in Oregon where they found a patch of Roundup Ready resistant wheat. Wasn't supposed to exist in the world. There it was. So we know the government, again, the corporations are doing what they will. And there's really no check and balance of it. So within this context, there's an administrative process. And this is out in Europe, I think. In the UK, possibly. Uh, support GM wheat trial. So this is a nice little thing that we can read on how to go about, and you need to think about how this works because this actually, when you address a, cor a government anymore, a corporation, a government, uh, typically you'll be dealing with it on an administrative side. So when you, if you get this list in your mind, if you get to what the object is here, you're going to be a lot better to be able to communicate on on substantial things, not not nonsense things that I keep seeing people do everywhere. It seems. Uh, let me read it here. Researchers in England have developed genetically modified wheat with higher levels of iron. Support GM wheat trials by sending your comments by March 4th in 2019 to DEFRA, the Department for Environmental Rule and Rural Affairs. Now, again, I can probably take these articles and talk and talk and talk to show you what's all in here, what they're telling you. This is the attack of your production utilizing uh, GM wheat and that is part of the biodiversity treaty if you thought that the biodiversity treaty was about keeping was about keeping wildlife species in living no that also has a part for the genetic modification this was done way back in 92 if you think this is all new stuff folks this is a, this is a plan against you to kill you off this is a plan to put the control in the hands of those that are the licensees to do this to you and i i can just relate this over in the united states to title 50 this is to the government to do because they say so. Why? Because they have the exception under the excuse and pretense of national security. Anyway, getting back to this. So th this is telling you this article says they're organizing up to make their comments. I'm saying, and this now, I bre uh, we go now, there's a, behind, there's a woodshed sorry, somewhere everywhere in the world. So n my voice does not, uh, is not ineffectual anywhere. So over those of you over in the UK, this is where it is, GovUK, uh, they're organizing up to bring comments. Now, I have to remind you, this comment process is not one of, not one of uh, vote like voting and popularity. It's one of substance, in particular, w answering what the agency's after. So each one of you has to send in something who wants to say something because you don't know if you send. So you don't know that your point not going to be made in order that can make the difference, or as they would apply it here in the United States, that you would take that meaningful comment that was not meaningfully addressed and enjoin the process for the agencies not doing meaningfully deter meaningful determinations, which turns out to be what the term arbitrary and capricious decision is. And you can shut down that whole process just by being the one that brings the one answer that's correct if there's no others. In other words, your comments written on three by five cards written by somebody else are, are by rule, not, not, not looked on more than one comment. You can have 10,000 3x5 cards that say the same thing, and that will be dealt with as one comment. And a lot of times those are set up in order to, to be defeated. So you, you buy into those petitions, and you're done. So you're not asserting your own observations. You're not engaging your own critical thought. You're not engaging the law, more importantly. You're not engaging the failures of what I would say, failures of due process are probably the most important at this point. Now, I'm hoping a lot of you didn't turn away when I'm talking about how this stuff is, and I'm hoping that when you listen, you're not just listening to my voice. You're actually saying, okay, maybe it is time I really need to get involved somewhere. I find a wrong I need to make right. I can too, take these tips. Even though they're applied to the U.K., you see they're all the same. It doesn't matter in the, in the world anymore. We're under global governance. This is a process that's administratively already governance. And so they go on to say that we as these uh, these so-called scientists are, going to get together and I'm where they're urging themselves to come and bring comments. I'm saying you need to counter those if there is something to counter. 
I'm not even saying that this is going to be bad. I'm saying that when you don't bring it, I'd have a, I have serious problems with the GMO, uh, GMO, but you know, there's a process that should check that. And if it's not, then maybe that's your problem and our problem. And that's what you need to go say on how it wasn't all adequately checked even. And we have, and hopefully I get to all this, we have all these questions the scientists themselves say that the scientists that are going to make comments don't have. Now, I find that uh, totally bizarre. They will deny there's any harm at the level of comment, but when you go talk to them, oh, yeah, we got lots of problems. And someone needs to be there to call that out, and there's a process to do that, and you don't come under any jeopardy to do so. So I don't know why people aren't uh, actually engaging this. Uh, to me, it, if you found out you lost the strength of a muscle that you were supposed to be flexing, you, you, yeah, no one likes to do exercise, but at some point when it means your literal life, your way of life, it means eventually getting you wherever you live in your house, you'd think at some point you'd, you'd not want someone dictating to you in your own house. At least have that res much respect for yourself and maybe those little ones around you and the upcoming generation that are clueless to it all. Remember, I've talked about clueless. It doesn't even know to ask the question. That's probably our most serious problem. So I bring questions, if nothing else. Here I'm bringing you a method. It's, I'm talking about the UK. It's uh, applicable everywhere. There's rule of law. That's because what the rule of law brought in was this method of destruction. And it's the method that sits inside these agencies as well. GM Freeze is a name. GM Freeze, an anti-biotech group, has been mobilizing their followers to flood DEFRA D-E-F-R-A. It's not really DEFRA as it's spelled here, but so understand the capitalization. This is a buddy who's supposed to be an editor of documents and a scientist and know how to do this, and the D-E-F-R-A is not capitalized here. And so, again, I show you, you can look inside the work of people experts say, and it's not so cool uh, a lot of times. There's errors everywhere. And this ends up related, this goes back on through the process, and it goes back in through the study. If you're going to have these types of typographical errors, it means you're not looking at the details. And when it becomes important, that that is the weak link in you. And so I'm not going to condemn anybody here. I'm saying that's what you do to keep a critical thought and observation. But moving on, as simple as not capitalizing D-E-F-R-A and making it a word, capitalized word, is a problem here. But not for us and what I want to kind of move on, just as an observation. They're mobilizing the followers to flood DEFRA with negative comments. See, again, uh, as I read this, there's just so much to talk about. I don't, I don't have time to talk to you about it. But see, they're imposing a negative comment on those that are counter to the, uh, that anti-biotech. You've got to come in and not be anti-anything. You've got to be, you got to say the facts. You can't, you can't, you got to speak to the point. You can't just come in and with your opinion. Uh, this was, that statement shows you that there's a, now a division. No one's interested to counter what is supposed to be reality. That This presumes that the so-called, the political scientist believes they're right. This is a very dangerous condition, and if you don't get your comment in that's not connected to GM freeze by stating the other things, then that voice of reason, actual reason and impartiality, will not ever be made. And I'm, we're talking of this in the UK. This happens in, even in your local, right where you live in your counties when they're making decisions relative to these methods that are destroying you for transportation decisions, your property taxes are involved, uh, uh, numerous things, uh, health, uh, even the, the production of growing of hemp or mining or anything in your locales. It's all the same process if you don't understand how connected the governance of the globe already is. The world order is coming through the administration of it. It's done. Now do you, you're over, and now all it is is that, that they have the conduit built up to take you out. Are you going to let them? You know, I'm sure lots of people will. I don't even know what to say to that. I'm so disgusted somehow, but I'm, i got to keep reading. This isn't the first time, some of you out there, see, there's some of you out there, and I know that. And so, here, this is the first time researchers in England have had to deal with anti-GMO groups. Back in 2012, protesters threatened to destroy tri field trials of aphid-resistant wheat. DEFRA isn't holding a vote or popularity contest. So I want to, now we get into the nuts and bolts. This agency is not holding a, po a vote for a, as a popularity contest. It's probably the most important thing you need to know when you're engaging in any capacity with the government. This is not how many people you can come in these capacities to come and how many votes that make it right. If you come with an irrelevant point and there's 10 of you that all come with the same point, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. You all better come with your own voice, with your own interpretation uh, and the facts and supported. You speak your point, you support your point, and then you and you submit it somehow by oral or written. I suggest written because that's the record. 
That's a ri every evidence is reduced to writing anyway. You might as well just put it there then. You can read from it. But it isn't a popularity contest. So when you hear the gang green, the environmental terrorists say, sign this card, you're, you're messing yourself up, and you act actually at advantage to those that are not environmental terrorists because you're going to write your own comment that's not based on a 3 by 5 card. Oh, you could put it on a 3 by 5 card. The point is you're not going to be stuck in one comment. The logic behind it is pretty simple. If I say the same thing as you, and someone else says the same thing as us, those three saying the same thing is really just the same thing, is it? It's one, and that's how you treat it. And so this is not a popularity contest. That we, how many 3 by 5 cards we can get is how many meaningful content, comments do you make relative to the object and duty of that committee that you're before? This would be in the courts, too, but it works a little different, but it's almost the same. You just pre you just bring it a little bit forward. It's, it's really said before the fact. Not as an interpretation. It comes as a support of your case. It's a little bit different application, but it's not a popularity contest. And so you can approach this as how many cards you can get together is like a petition, send it in. It's wrong. That's the wrong way to go. Uh, they ask specifically for, quote, representations on any risks of damage being caused to the environment by the release applied for in this application, close quote. Now, this is a, a line, an instruction. But you have to go to, as I tell you, go for the United States, the Federal Register. They'll tell you what they're looking for. That's what you confine your comment to. Now, I say also, you also bring up any due process violations. Because once they have a violation, it doesn't matter what their question is. If they violated the content, the due process requirement, it doesn't matter what their question is. But you have to identify that something's been done. I do this in every comment we make. I find the the due process violations walking into it and I find the due process violations that are going to happen because of the way they did the meeting. In other words, if you if you were at a public uh, presentation and they don't allow some comments because they didn't make enough time, that's a subsequent comment you make. You hold back your comment till you make it written and you say they weren't even letting everybody make comments because they didn't provide adequate time for the public comment. That's a due process violation. So they couldn't have taken enough information. We don't know any one of the ones not taken could have been enough to stop the process. We don't know that. That's a comment period, a point. And you file that. And if they move this thing through and you can prove on the evidence it wasn't all taken, just take your copy of your evidence that says, no, we're only picked and chosen. We pick and chose from a lottery, and there's a whole lot of people there that didn't get to speak. You're likely to get that thing stopped. And it goes back to the process until they learn how to do it right. Now, what we found out is if you do that, it shuts the process down because they know they're going to get it returned, and that's a big embarrassment. They don't want that. They don't want you to know, uh, let anybody know how it's done, so they're not going to let that thing go forward. And so what they usually there's two options. They either stop or else they have some more hearings. So you've got to show up again, and you've got to keep pointing out their due process violations. The amount of hearings doesn't make a good hear a due process either. So they're not holding a, a, a prop later contest. They're asking for specific things that you have to figure out in their, in their notice. They should tell you. And if you choose to provide a comment, remember that helpful comments are evidence-based. And this is it. Support your comment. And make sure that the evidence is objective or and or you can attack the other side. Uh, if you see the oppos there's an opposition to it, they're going to provide an evidence. You attack that for not actually being evidence-based, but under the color of evidence-based, and that's fraud. And so you look at the other side if you can, and you put that in your comment. Or, as I would like to do, I, we either send in a comment on the law, and that, that for us ends it, or we wait to see how the response is, and then we'll respond to the the hearing that was had, and we go ahead and attack other things that we wouldn't have known before. So we make all one comment, and we expose the entirety uh, in our comment. Uh, are any of us in jeopardy when we do that? No, no, none of us are in jeopardy. So we get to have an evident piece of paper we write that says the, that makes the point. And so for those of you that don't like speaking in public, there you don't there you have no excuse. Uh, then it goes on to say here is instruction, and I'm taking this. Uh, this, this web page is instruction as well. Discuss the specific risks and benefits posed by the GM wheat in this application. has a link. Not just GMOs in general. Absolutely. Look at the extensive part of this. Bring it in. They have to consider it. The information below, if you don't, then they don't have to. See, this is how that works. And then you don't understand. The agency is in a deference condition. In other words, what they say rules. 
And that's why you have to find and take their knees out from underneath them on their decision. That's how, really how the, how your attack has to be. And I say that in the context that this isn't a method driven agenda and you're gonna, that's why we have to do it this way. Otherwise it would be straight up and honest and it's not. The information below in the project fact, another link, may be useful as you write your email. Folks, if you're going to engage, get the link from this, this uh, website, Biofortified, if you don't think what they're biased, and go find out what they're telling their people on how to approach this. If you, have no, if you don't get it from me or you didn't go research it, just take it from, uh, from these people that are organizing up to push through gene-modified uh, uh, food. These same people will not answer my questions as the, the, at least the collateral damage. They make excuses for it. That's good enough for me to put it in a comment. So there, you, you can take all this stuff as you as you want, but the answers are here for us to do. And this is a real simple thing to do. Just take interest in it. Take responsibility. Stop stop bickering about amongst yourselves. We're not going anywhere there. The Brookings Institute describes five steps to an effective public comment. Another link. Number one, this is in summary, introduce why are you why you are interested. Well that okay. List the credentials or experience that may be your comment relevant make your comment relevant. Like you're the ultimate consumer that's got a digestive tract that's been found to be altered by gene modification. Maybe that's a good comment. That's why it's relevant. At any rate, you make it up as you go. Whatever comes to your mind to outmaneuver these guys that are trying to bring what sounds like plausible reasons. They're only doing the half truth, if you will. You bring the you bring the underlying foundation to kills it all. Clearly identify the issues of why which you are commenting and list your recommendations. That's an important one that I was gonna. I haven't. I've got to clarify a little bit better with a couple of my colleagues. You just don't make a comment. And this is in the alternative dispute resolution. You have to make the alternative as well. Make recommendations. Make them intelligent. Maybe just following a law it might be good enough. Like for mining, that's the, typically the main thing. Why don't we just follow the law as an alternative? Because these other the alternatives that are proffered through the process are not the law. How about if we follow the law? Maybe that will clean it up. If we follow the law first and then we see what we need to do if there's an alternative. And so don't don't underestimate the power of putting in the fact that the, the recommendation is an alternative to do what you actually should do instead of what everyone, the agendites, want to do uh, in furthering what whatever agenda they have. Number three, provide analysis and evidence to support your recommendations. Absolutely. Always evidence-based. Be careful it's not political evidence, though, that science uh, experts say stuff. Four, summarize your recommendations. That's now just the form of a normal letter. You Put your, uh, you do an entry paragraph on what you're going to talk about, why you're there, this and that. You give the body, and then at the end, you summarize what you've said. So when someone looks at the last lines of the paper, in a short paragraph, you give them the, you give them the whole thing, restate it again. Number five, list your citations of, for any information you relied upon. Absolutely. We just make an appendix, and we attach whatever documents that we have. We make citations or whatever, just like a really fancy book report. And so I found these five uh, Brookings uh, institution uh, things per pretty good. You get a link. Why not? There's no excuse here. You can all turn away. You can uh, say you know better. And I just know that things going over the cliff here, no one's doing any better. So we better start something organized in yourself, more than more importantly. Iron deficiency is still a major problem. Biofortification is one solution. That was very important. It's one solution. Here's the alternative. Why don't we go find the other solutions before we start dealing in genetic modification that we actually don't know the ramifications to? How about that? No, that's just a bullet point to you. You'd have to support that. I'll, if I ever get there, boy, this stuff takes such a long time. There's all kinds of information you could throw together. Now they're gonna. This this website's gonna prove why iron is important. Well, but what about the alternatives? And that's what you're speaking to. They're going to bring one. You have to bring the other. It's not just being anti. Many groups of people across the world, and here, we get educated about iron, okay? I don't know. Why don't you just give everybody a cast iron pot and tell them to cook out of it? How about like that? Many groups, well, but, okay, did you put that down? No, if you didn't enter in and get yourself as a, a stick in the spokes, they're not going to consider it. Many groups of people across the world suffer from iron deficiency anemia. 
Now, this, uh, to my mind, uh, I shouldn't interject. It, it, it now points more to women, and this is the other problem. Remember, the problem of women, children, and the indigenous are stalking horses. And so, inside this is they don't even understand they're they're touching on this. I look at it, I see the again. I, I if I can say I have certain glasses that allows me to see them, and you need to see those glasses too. And so that's another point inside it. I'd be going look possibly going and looking at this uh, agenda to do this as a global agenda for the purpose of the stalking horse and not the actual purpose. In other words, your alternatives prove that out. But there are alternatives they could choose instead of messing with the food and messing with the uh, the uh, potentially messing with the environment. When they said that there was no GM weed in Oregon, that's an ex uh, a proof that they does get out into the world and they can't control it. And so you now have a threat to the environment, just what they are asking for, correct? Anyway, getting back to this, they're going to tell us about I anticipated women. That would mean also pregnancies of children. That's in the global structure of why you how this whole thing is coming down. And stocking horses, not real reasons, but stocking horses. It's not that uh, iron is not a problem. It's that uh, they're trying to promote an alternative to how you would normally do it easily. I just said it again. But, yeah, something easier than, than maybe genetic, expensive genetic alternatives. So anemia is a serious problem. It causes stunting in children. And pregnant women, double risk of death for pregnant women. So there you are. There's two of the, then we could throw the indigenous on there. How about indigenous women that are going to have children? See, they're right in the, the global discussion. These people don't even understand that they're in there. But I can just give it the innocence of this. It tells me that they're fulfilling the government. They're already educated to fulfill the government, the global agenda in their statements and what they point out. Iron deficiency, did you hear him talk about guys here, did you? No. Okay, inner iron deficiency anemia has been reduced with supplementation and fortification of foods. Oh, okay, so there's one of the alternatives. Even with the, those efforts, iron deficiency st remains a major global health problem. Is that true? Do you say support that? And if so, what are the alternatives that are not being done? I mean, it was a, a quite a striking thing in my mind when I was a young and to find out that a lot of our problems that uh, people weren't so sanitary and when we got more organized about that in health departments, the health departments actually helped us to understand getting, getting hygiene was important. And when that happened, it happened to correlate with a lot of other pharma stuff. Uh, health got better, got less sick, all that stuff. And it was just amazing to me as a little one looking, looking on the society. It had to be told about hygiene. It didn't figure it out on its own. And yet when it started to practice it better, we got better. We got more healthy or less sick, I suppose. And so what about all these things that are, well, why is it a global health problem? Well, we really don't know, maybe. We have to go look and see some basic things that are not told to people. They just don't get it. That's an astonishing thing to me somehow. But anyway, while interventions like supplements and gardens are nice, see how they demean the potential? You have to go look at that because if the bottom line here is if they could be upgraded and the cost is less or even even not if it's just the more effective because you're not what doing what you're not inventing a bioorganism that will pollute the world maybe that's an important reason uh, but you can go back to nice you see they they're nice no they're, this is either it either works or it doesn't you see how the subjective tone came in and there's no evidence for that either. So within their own comment here on this page, you can see how they demean certain things to raise others, and you have to be there to check that. And this is not just on this GM stuff. This is on everything that these people are anywhere, are anywhere, folks, in your backyard, coming into you, your back kit, your kitchen, in your bedroom, everywhere. They're coming there to make policy on stuff, and they do it just like this. Oh, it's nice you had that, but we're going to do it this way. And no, don't forget that these are all conflicts of interest on their industry, aren't they? And where their jobs, how they get fed. They don't care about uh, really looking too deep. They'll accept their risk takers at some level. They'll, they'll accept the, the bean counters risk management. But maybe their sons or daughters and them won't be sick. In fact, this one author has a daughter who is sick. But will not admit to a pop, will not even entertain the fact that maybe where the actual cause, a scientist that will not search out the cause of the harm to her daughter, fascinates me. And yet will promote this kind of thing. So these are promoting, they're organizing, and they're coming to a country near you to bring this agenda in, and they're going to do it through the administrative process. You need to be there to counter this stuff, or this comes into your food system. This comes into your, the biology of your area of plants. 
the benefits that can potentially spread to every farmer and every person who eats biofortified food. Potentially? Where's the evidence for that? Or do you, is evident, when you say potentially, have you negated your ability to bring evidence? It's only potential. You've really admitted it's not fact, haven't you? But you see, if you don't, aren't there to counter that, not to just say, oh, this is the potential. No, you say it may be said it's a potential, but that's not a fact, and that's not proven, and besides, we have other alternatives. You can tie your stuff together pretty well here. And so they have more links on how you can go learn their aspect. My own thesis research authors re on, on the novel approaches to improving qualities of maize endosperm includes efforts to increase iron levels in maize. Efforts. And you'll find as they talk, they're having trouble doing that. So no, maybe it's not so easy. Maybe it's not something, maybe nature's resistant for a reason. Unfortunately, staple grains lack genetic diversity for iron. So breeding for higher iron levels isn't really possible for crops like wheat or corn. Plant breeding has been successful in developing wheat in higher levels of zinc, another mineral important for human health. But despite decades of trying, international plant breeders have not been able to increase iron levels in wheat. All right? well, there's a whole thing to say there. I'm going to have to keep passing because so much time is passing on this. I've got so much more to go cover. One concern with biofortification as a solution to micronutrient deficiency is whether costly seeds will be made available to all. Oh, well, so we have no solution here, correct? It's actually a hope. It's a concern, not a business. It's a worry. They already know this. This is one of your, what you do. See, that's what I was saying. There's an alternative to lesser costly, lesser involved, lesser bureaucratically tied in, lesser fraudulent contract written type of monopolies that are created around this. Extend it out to there in your comment. This happens like when your public-private partnership, your leverage funding at home in the United States of America, when they're deciding to do some kind of so-called service for you in your county. It's all the same stuff here, folks. I don't even know why this is such a hard thing, why no one's ever seen it. It's right here. In the case of the GM high iron wheat private seed company, interests are not currently a concern. Quote, the development of this part particle wheat line, particular wheat line was initially funded by the non-for-profit organization Harvest Plus. And subsequently, it was publicly funded by the UK Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council. And you know what I talk about councils here in the United States. Licensing and breeding the trait into locally relevant varieties is still a consideration, but the first step is making sure the trait performs in the field environment. And this is relevant to the speech. They want to get it in the field to see if it's even anything. Do you need that risk? I guess we're going to go talk about risk management. That's what you're talking about here. GM wheat with high iron is being developed. Even though they don't can't do it. So what's the why are you putting the environment on a th I'm talking about where you live, not the environment they talk about. I'm talking about your environment, where you live and breathe and eat. Why are they allowed to put any threat on this when they don't even have it? They, they admitted they don't even have it. It's very difficult. It's, nature doesn't want it that way. Maybe you need to be looking at a variety of foods, maybe. Maybe you think we're not going to make Soylent Green work. How about that one? You can't get it in a cracker. GM wheat with high iron is being developed. I'll just skip that. It's uh, on its face of failure. Uh, support GM wheat trials today. And if you follow the guidelines we outline above, your comment could have a significant impact in these trials. That's right. But it won't unless it's meaningful. It will if it is meaningful. And that's the point of they say the word impact. That's what you're speaking to is impacts. Impacts can be positive or negative. So you have to outline those. That's what they're looking for. In this case, apparently specific to the environment in which this stuff is growing. And they will say, well, we have it under control. It can't. It's only going to go to wheat. It's not going to, it's not going to uh, go to the point where it's going to have seeds anywhere. They can't. They can't. Uh, you already have evidence. That's not the truth. They can't contain it. Oregon's the proof. And I think there was, a, I think Washington, they found it too. They can't contain this stuff. So once it's done, it can go on and on and on. Field trials are just as a, one important step in the process. If the trials show that the wheat variety are high in iron in a typical field, uh, the researchers still have much work to do. If, they should already know. But do we want to do the GM? And we found out plenty of evidence that we have problems uh, with uh, even the silence against what attacking the 
genes do to pro plants. They have a response. Their nature's tough. It, it, it creates a defense. And they're finding out it causes all kinds of anomalies that they don't understand. And they, they do stuff. They push the cherry red button and see what happens. Is that, where, is that what you want to do? Have your environment be like? Your actual living environment? Not the one, the commerce one they want to create and make advantage for them and monopolize against you? Go read the Biodiversity Treaty again. That was a declaration of war on, on people. I don't, I don't know why people don't see it that way. Just bring up now this unintended consequence of maybe we push the button and don't know. Go to those Chinese CRISPR twins. And I, and I need to tie this together. We're going to keep going. But I'm going to tie you. you got to keep holding this in, in your mind about how this stuff is. They don't know what actually goes on. And it's all conjecture. But they do have evidence that could that is makes the response to these uh, gene modifications highly probable. The CRISPR gene twins might have had their brains inadvertently enhanced. Boy, isn't that a promotion for what they've been saying. The brains of two genetically edited girls born in China last year may have been changed in ways that enhance cognition and memory, scientists say. The twins, called Lula and Nana, reportedly had their genes modified before birth by a Chinese scientific team using the new editing tool CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-I-R. I won't go through that what it means. I may come to the website uh, that I have that down the road. Maybe not. It's already time's passing so far down the road. The, the goal was uh, was to make the girls immune to infection by HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. There's a whole story behind that. That's a story. Now, new research shows that the same alteration introduced into the girls' DNA deletion of a gene called CCR5 not only makes mice smarter, but also improves human brain recovery after stroke and could be linked to greater success in school. Boy, haven't they twisted this whole, the horror that they said they didn't know, now they're turning it around to what they need. So they introduce the shock, they go say they're coming after these guys, but in fact now they're doing the studies to try and show, this is, oh, this is an enhancement. What about the agenda is uh, an, not an enhancement? See, they always enhance and modify and modernize. Doesn't mean it's good. But anyway, going on. So the, remind remind yourself, as we say, I told you when we looked at the dragonfly, that it was genetically enhanced to receive the biosynthetic uh, uh, data, digital uh, hardware. I think you're seeing part of that right here, but they're also selling the idea you can have your child enhanced perform better in school. They don't even really know that, but that's what they're promoting. I don't know how, how, how you perceive this. It's very dangerous here, what I'm reading to you. How they move this along is, is just, you're watching how they do this. The answer is likely yes, it did affect their brain. Yeah, well, well, to what extent too? What else did it do? But it's likely, not proven. So it's likely... Yes, it did their, affect their brains. Well, that's interesting. They weren't targeted to affect their brains, but now they're finding out that it did, at least by mice trials. And I'll go with that. Why? Because it's an impact uh, unplanned, right? Un, unintended consequence. However, you might subjectively receive an enhancement. It still was a thing they didn't know that they are now are thinking that did happen. And now we don't even speak of the limit now, but where else did it do it? This uh, C Al Cino J. Silva is a neurobiologist who says, yeah, it did affect their brains. In other words, they knew it would. They know that there's uh, these extended consequences that they're denying in every other field when it comes to medicine or enhancements in your food, or fetal tissue in your, in your vaccines and fetal tissue in your Pepsi for t flavor enhancement. His lab, who's uncovered a major new role of the CCR5 gene in memory and the brain's ability to form new connections. New connections. Oh, so that biosynthesis connection, I guess, that Elon Musk is designing. The simplest interpretation is that these mutations, you mutants, will probably have an impact on cognitive function, will probably have an impact on cognitive function in the twins, says Silva. He says the exact effect on the girl's cognition is impossible to predict 
and that is why it should not be done. Boy, I can adjust that to the move over to the wheat on that. Oh, how could it do that? Wheat has a brain? Well, no, we're talking about mutations, aren't we? They're impossible to predict. So, word of warning. Not that you have a, well, I guess maybe your youngins may have this choice to make. My point here is to show that science was willing to push the cherry red button at every time and hope everything works right. And they know some things that they're not telling you. And this is a scary, scary future. So I wanted to bring that up. And I know it was in conjunction with the wheat, but I don't see a distinction when you're talking about opposing genetic modification. At some point, I, you know, the technology is really neat. And it was really neat up until I found out about these unintended things. And then I found out, actually, the experts say don't know. And when you hear someone who's supposed to be the expert on CR5, who's found a major new Roy's guide studying it, and he says it's impossible to predict, I would take that to the bank, folks. I would take that to the bank. And so, here we go, moving on. As we get into lab stuff, technocracy in your life. I start with administrative procedures, how you need to engage, how do you need to interject to counter the stuff that you hear that's out there for two reasons. One is to counter it as we learn to stop it completely. Uh, and this is the kind of guiding me through that mining stuff because we have, to, we have to deal with things that are wrong now while we're moving to end the problem. And it's endable, I guess, is the other thing. We can stop it if we just get everyone doing the, the law, essentially. The thing that's already written down, there's no extraneousness that has to happen. It fixes itself. And that's, I guess, my point. A good comment is, why don't we just do the law and fix itself? We'll see what the alternatives might need to be, but on a much smaller scale, without such a, a, an unintended potential, an unintended consequence potential. But no, government's going to push, at least the United States is going to push forward. And this came out a uh, long time back, to show you how long ago uh, that I had these on my tabs, but they're coming relevant again. In November of 2018, I was going to bring this out. To show you, be careful. Here, here comes the stuff, and now we got the rule. Now we got all the news coming that it is. The U.S. paves the way to get lab meat on plates. Now, this lab meat, you have to understand, it's also chemistry at some level, but it's also utilizing uh, genetically modified materials that they now don't, for the most part, and with the CRISPR, they don't have to tell you is going on. All with unintended things going on, mutations that are not predictable. And they say, oh, well, what you're eating it, you're not living it. Well, wait a minute, it goes into my gut. My, I have little organisms that are the size of the things that they've altered, that were the things that they did alter. You don't think that's going to cause me trouble? And we have facts that prove, or studies that prove that they are altering your gut. All right, so they're altering how you synthesize your, uh, the things that keep you going. And I, I, that's a different, okay, there's a couple, uh, some of you that may have be aware, the stuff that's in your gut, that's the physical thing. There's also this energy field, okay? So I don't want to get too lost in all that. But there's all, all kinds of stuff that science won't even look at here. And I don't want to get too esoteric, but it's there. And we all have a sense of it. But we can see it in the gut, the physical gut problems. And I got a story I just realized way down the tabs. I was going to talk about all during this. This uh, this tab reminds me of a whole bunch of other tabs where I talk about baby's gut uh, bacteria. I didn't get to present that. Uh, I think Grammy Mary might have done it on one of her broadcasts a while back where the baby's gut biome is different when you start interjecting all these things. And then I have told, I did tell you behind the woodshed that the gut biome was altering how and what gets created and what organisms are in your gut biome that do the, the, the processing that keeps you healthy. And they're interfering with all that. But U.S. authorities on Friday, back in November now, old news, cr agreed on how to regulate, f they agreed, the authorities agreed, on how to regulate food products cultured with animal cells, paving the way to get so-called lab meat on American plates. The Department of Agriculture of all, and the Food and Drug Administration, should be Feed and Drug, I keep, keep telling you, agreed, that's what maybe a comment should go in, you should change your name to Feed. We no longer have food. At uh, any, any rate, that's a, that's a thought to come to me. Uh, food uh, and Drug Administration agreed to share regulation of cell cultured food products, they said in a joint statement following the public meeting October. While technical details have yet to be confirmed, the FDA would oversee the collection and differentiation of cells when the stem cell development, <laughs> when the stem cells develop to specialized cells 
while USDA would oversee production and labeling of food products. Where, where are they getting stem cells but, but from maybe aborted fetuses? Okay, so not the only source. But anyway, it, 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 I start getting too deep in this. It makes me sick to my gut. Now hopefully, and hopefully I keep my diet in good shape so my gut can handle it. And I don't go nuts. Anyway, right here they were telling you they're, they're agreeing on how they're going to move this cultured lab meat that's using animal cells. These are all GMO animal cells that they'll be doing. Uh, this is all, uh, I remember the organoid brain. Okay, folks, here, this, excuse me, there, here's, here's the, the big point about how this works. Uh, they did this way back in November. Uh, my, I made the observation then that included, uh, that included genotified, uh, genetically modified cultures was included in this, and then I was making the observation, and if you were there to make a, a, a comment, you could have to say, maybe why don't you, when you do these, allow these things, since you're uh, saying that they are so-called food, why don't you put a, a GM in front of everything that is GM modified? And you look through the article, and the company, the companies that do it should change their names so that there was a G-Mosa, G-Meat, G Mo Emphas and G Meats was the companies that they said were going to do it. Just add a G to these companies so we know they're co that what they produce is genetically modified. So when we read it out, their companies on the label, we'll be able to identify that they're, uh, they're, that they're gene, gene modification animal cells in this so called food. It's feed. And I've a I asked the question wouldn't that be honest labeling? In other words, you throw that in as a comment. Uh, isn't it? dishonest when you're not telling people about these gene modifications that they know they can, can't can predict the unintended consequences. There's The mutations are in uh, unpredictable and yet you're you're sweeping them under the rug. Did you look at that? Well, now you get it. Now you get a bigger. Was it meaningful what you actually decided there? But see, no one was there to, to discuss this and I didn't get to it on the notes, so it's gone. I guess you could integrate it back in. Uh, it does. It's a concur It's a common you have a right to have better food than what they did. If you can find a process, you can reopen the process, I suppose. But it has to be really big, but you could do it, uh, the problem. So anyway, it uh, paves the way. United States paves the way, way back in November. And remember that peak slime story? Uh, all of a sudden, there a big uproar, everybody, and then it calmed down, and McDonald's decided, I'm not going to put pink slime in my food and all this other stuff. Well, okay, it's back in the news. The United States government just reclassified pink slime as ground beef. For all you legalists out there, We'll just change the term. We'll just find it. We'll have a hearing, and we'll just decide that it's ground beef. And in a way, think about it. It's just ground beef. It's the parts as parts, and they grind it up into an even finer texture. And it's just fat and meat and tenons, isn't it? And feathers and all this other stuff, isn't it? You're not going to know. It's like you won't know your soiling green cracker. Boy, I didn't know I'd get back on that subject. But remember the dreaded pink slime video from 2012? There it was, some indescribable pink paste extruding from a, through a machine. What, was it strawberry ice cream? A new type of Play-Doh? Nope. Pink slime was basically the meat industry equivalent of the trimmings and scraps that are normally swept up and tossed in the trash or into pet food. A collection of bits collected from the meat production process that is transformed, remember the transformation, transparent to you, into a filmy translucent substance using a centrifuge which is then treated with ammonia hydroxide gas and added to commercial ground beef, usually in the fast food or school cafeterias, you mind-controlled feed animals. All your sons and daughters already getting this stuff. Ammonia hydroxide reminded me of a picture I saw on the Duma uh, gas attack that was blamed on Assad. And I noticed, I remembered someone, uh, they had found a piece of paper with a the... So, um, supposedly the cyanide chemical formula written on a piece of paper proving that it was uh, it was done done by by whoever had that that list and i looked at the the chemicals uh, that they listed and and what it was was uh, some uh, ammonium carbonate it was it wasn't even the sarin gas compo compositions it wasn't anything it wasn't much, nothing of that it wasn't anything poisonous uh, gas like that at all it was simply a chemical process to move uh, ammonium carbide into ammonium sulfate which is fertilizer which is the first step i suppose to making a bomb material but not a gas and so ammonium hydroxide ammonium is a very important thing it's uh, nitrogen a lot of hydrogen uh, tied together it's very very responsive uh, in uh, in nature 
once you make it into explosives, and it does similar things in your body relative to the, I guess, endothermic process, some of the endothermic processes in your body. Anyway, it's a nat- somewhat of a natural thing. You know, ammonia ammonia is what you'd re- you you leach out, and then it's what make it's it's converted into other uh, eventual things uh, for other animals and critters and beasties to live on. And so they they do this to kill hydrogen uh, ammonia hyd- hydroxide kills all that bacteria that's all in that meat. Remember? So this is kind of like how a lot of this stuff works. When you pasteurize, you're killing off all the bad stuff that's already there. They don't get rid of it. They just kill it off, and you. Uh, consume it, and it's just not as as deadly to you. Uh, but so now this pink slime is uh, is now been deemed uh, to be by the uh, Department of, uh, of Agriculture to be ground beef. The slimy goo is actually ground beef. So they had a problem. Well, in fact, I think it was ABC News that got sued, and they had to settle 177 million dollars uh, in settlement. And so that starts to do it. They got the USDA allowed the corporation to come in and and prove its case. I don't know if anybody got notice of that, but if anybody maybe responded, whether they did or not, it ends up coming out administratively that pink slime now can be ground beef. They don't have to tell you that they're using it. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, every once and again, a hamburger will come through and I taste ammonia. And I suppose that's the stuff that's got, that's got this ammonia hydroxide in it. I can send, I got a, relatively sensitive uh, uh, nose and taste. So I tend to be able to pick up some stuff periodically, and I'm thinking, well, this is that mysterious, that's mysterious meat here. But they just redefine the term, and this is what how they're doing this stuff to you. So you want to have pink slime. It's all part of this meat that's the drippings and droppings. Well, you also have the lab meat. You don't think that's coming into maybe as a filler? Looking for the cheapest way to feed you, not food you, but feed you. And so this brings up, the, brought up another thing I had a long time ago to talk about. It's now making the news here the last month or so. Again, coming back around, I suppose, or people are just starting to find out about it. Uh, so now we go from pink slime to ground beef, just because they put the name on it. They had a hearing, but you didn't, you didn't participate. So now you get to have pink slime, ammonia hydroxided uh, pink slime in your ground beef as ground beef. No, but they're doing something else that's coming in alongside that, in parallel to this, which is kind of scary in a way, but, you know, I guess you can pay attention or not. Uh, Impossible Foods, Bleeding Burgers, to make grocery store debut in 2019, was a story also back in November of 2018 I was going to speak about all in one string. Didn't get to it. But the important thing about here was the promotion by this Impossible Burger. If it's impossible, how does it exist? And this is really the tail of the tape. They actually named it the right thing. It's an impossible burger. It's not a burger, and it won't be. And uh, But they were going to get, because no one else is going to talk about it, they'll eventually get this. The problem with this story was that they were promoting impossible burger by, by Silicon Valley Impossible Foods. is a plant-based burger that mimics the sensory experience of meat burger through the isolation of overlapping properties found in plants. If you don't think you're not about to live in the matrix, it's a sensory experience, folks. It even bleeds like meat. If you don't these people think these people are sick, while the company has yet to provide further details about the retail launch, remember this is back in November. This announcement is sure to please its eager plant-based fan base. By far, the number one message from the fans on the social media is, "Quote: When will I be able to buy and cook the Impossible Burger at home?" said Impossible Food CEO and founder Patrick Brown. Dr. Patrick Brown, what an authority. We can't wait until some chefs experience the magic and delight of the first plant-based meat that actually cooks and tastes like meat from animals without any compromise. So, big promotion on this. Let me get on through here because it's really the story's not that much to tell. I don't want to, but it's a lot, there's a lot to say, but the real point I wanted to bring any of this up is that the, this thing that's a sensory experience, it's a bleeding plant-based burger, is actually made by a product that was synthesized from soy. And it's a protein that's concentrated. And they've been this Impossible Foods has been seeking administrative agreement that they can sell this. Impossible Foods receives no questions letter from U.S. Food and Drug Administration, which was also done back in July of 2018, how long this stuff sits here, and we keep agreeing with it by not responding to it. 
Uh, and then they promote that Impossible Foods has received a no questions letter from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and they quake validating the unanimous conclusion of food safety experts that its key ingredient is safe to eat. That was a a publication they put on their website. Now. You can believe that, or you can start looking at the point. What caught my eye was, Impossible Foods makes meat directly from plants with a much smaller environmental footprint than meat from animals. The company uses modern science and technology to create wholesome and nutritious food, restore natural ecosystems, and feed a growing population sustainably. Okay, so this goes on to tout what Impossible Foods is about, but that second paragraph caught me to go back and say, well, food safety experts say this key ingredient is safe to eat. And so I went back and did. I had to stop. I had to go, okay, I'm not going to take their word for it. We've got a sustainable problem, don't we? And so I went and I read the documentations, and this is the Twitter I posted back when. Having no questions of firm safety, the, F, the FDA sent a no questions letter that the company is saying affirms safety. And I asked that the FDA had no questions. We don't know what the question was that was posed to the posed to the company, that they had no further questions on whatever that was. Did that really affirm safety? That's my question. If so, I go on to say, what did this mean in the 2018-723 FDA letter Impossible Foods uses? A quote, this letter is not an affirmation that soy legumoglobin preparation is GRAS under 21 CFR 170.35. Unless noted above, our review did not address other provisions of the FDNC. Now, how can this company come out and say this is a safe, as a, as a safe, a, 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 I can't remember what GRS, it just slipped my mind. It's a generally received as safe or whatever. That how, how could this company, when the government, the letter, and remember, they went to the rule of the code, the black and white, the government letter by the code, which they have to follow, did not extend such a affirmation. Is these people lying, and they're still running, and they're still getting the stuff forward, and this is, well, here's your problem I wanted to point out. The legumoglobin preparation is a concentration which they have found people respond to, like an allergy. And it's made by genetic modified material, uh, organisms and plant materials to do this. And so you see right here uh, evidence that the FDA did not actually allow this through. What they didn't have is any more questions based on a presentation of Impossible Foods on a different question. And so I'm offering this in the idea of the administration and responding so we get a sense of how to work this thing, how we're being taken down, to show you have to go into the documentations and look very carefully, and then you start making out the failures that they're doing. And I don't know if there's much, um, you know, the company's going to go on, but here they're going to said they already told you that they're promising to have this in the food, in the stores by 2019, and they're going to move forward as a lie about what the FDA, FDA did. Now, it's not going to be, apparently, not going to be labeled. So now how are you supposed to know? And you're now you're now taking in these organisms that are genetically modified, that the one who's working on at least one of the uh, the aspects for brain says, well, we can't know these mutations. They're just not, not possible. And tied in with the, with the fact of the genetically modification of people, was John Rappaport saying genetically modified people? What could go wrong? Well, I don't want to read more. You can read that article. Back in uh, 2017, he wrote that thing. How long we have been watching this, and no one does much of anything. What could go wrong? Well, the, the guy who's working on one, one, one thing in the brain says it's already impossible to know. What could go wrong is about anything, isn't it? And so we can sit as crickets and not respond, or we can say, wait a minute, now here's a body of evidence. Support your statement with evidence that shows that you better look into all of this before we move on or everything you do as an agency is arbitrary and capricious. In fact, you now see that the agency itself sees that the you have evidence that the company who's seeking a, a safe uh, recommendation will actually lie about that letter uh, that the FDA sent. In other words, they're not you can't trust them. And so if we can't trust them to tell the truth about a direct FDA letter that we can read, how can we trust that their science, any science at all, would be factored in uh, accurate, honest, and 
uh, dis full of uh, full disclosure. So you just start to peck away at what they have established as the authority. And this is my problem with the 5G problem is that with those of that want to go after it, you realize it might be a little bit tough. The problem is is the experts that they use may not have the standards quite right. You have to attack that too. It's not a problem. It's just what you have to do. It's one more step, I guess. It's not that hard, actually. It's just figuring it out. It took a little bit to get the uh, learning of the knowledge of it. You know, I had to read that, like that one article. When you go read the letter, it doesn't. It says it right in the letter. It's not supporting a, a such a such an uh, admission, a confirmation that it's safe. In fact, it says that there's been problems. People, they have allergies, just like a peanut allergy or something. It's serious. They'll kill you. Well, I guess that was the other thing. Word to the wise, folks. This stuff's going to kill you. Uh, I don't. You can't know it's not going to kill you. You could be that genetically predisposed um, body that just can't handle this particular concentration of this particular protein, or or whatever, whatever the whatever it is they're doing. So genetically modified people, what could go wrong? Yeah, well, back now we go through and we see that their companies will lie about the certifications they don't have and they need. And we see a scientist who says, oh, we, I don't, yeah, no, we can't predict any of these mutations. Well, what could go wrong in people, folks? And that led me on to the back, getting back to those organoid brains that we talk, talked about. I thought that was, you know, this is kind of, in a way, it's like funny. I, I think this is the, what a joke that we got running for a life uh, anymore. A lab-grown mini brain spontaneously produced human-like brain waves for the first time. I think I reported on this. But I wanted to bring this up in the context of the fact that they're doing genetic modification on people. What, why not do it on these organoid brains? They have brain-like, brain, -like brain uh, human-like brain waves for the first time. In other words, you put these structures together and life happens. Connections go on. They don't have control over any of this. And now we find out that the, the mutations are not predictable. Neuroscientists from the United States uh, University of California, San Diego, observed spontaneous electrical activity that resembles human brain waves and lab-grown mini-brain for the first time. They hope this breakthrough will allow researchers to fund to study the early stages of brain disorders like epilepsy in infants, which is usually difficult or impossible due to the difficulty of an analyzing a fetus in utero, which in which in uh, New York will mean nothing. It just doesn't matter. Having a little bit of a problem with the baby two seconds before it's going to be born, kill it, take care of it. We need parts as parts for us. We need the umbilical. We need all the stem cells. Right? We need the mini brain. We're going to attach this kid's mini brain. Now we're going to make an organoid uh, uh, mini brain from an actual brain. Because we've we've pulled the wraps off of all uh, ethical constraint, the future needs it. Now let's get back to this lab-grown mini brain. What they talk about lab-grown meat, right, folks? And they can put this animal cells in your feed. Let's go back to John Rappaport. What could go wrong, folks? Well, if you're not there to kind of start saying something. We're going to find out. And we're finding out that those of us that are still alive that start eating this feed do get epigenetically changed. We may not suffer the neuro, neuron adjustments that the twins in China are to probably receive a neurosynthesis device for digital communication to the world, uh, but we're going to uh, be affected in other ways that will bring us uh, subject to other things and likely the the weaponization, uh, population control weaponization. And so my question on all of this stuff has been, because of the uh, sustainable agenda, has this one principle that seemingly they'll use against you, but we need to maybe assert it against the system, if you will. If you say nothing, it doesn't get asserted, so I'm bringing it up for those that will, regarding the concern for a precautionary standard. Remember, the precautionary principle is don't do anything until you know it doesn't do any harm. That's what they're using against us. Yet you look at the administration of the human animal in the government, and they don't they could care less. It's about the bottom line. I think we maybe bring in the precautionary principle here. If they think they're going to have an impossible burger that's sustainable, maybe we need to bring in the precautionary principle. Hold their feet to the fire. They did fraud on the public by saying that this was agreed that this material is good for you when there's evidence in the letter that says that it's not. Now, regarding the precautionary standard, why do they think plants and other organisms are any different? 
In other words, why aren't they applying the with when it, you have a science one scientist saying, "Hey, this is a, we have no way. It's impossible." Talk about impossible burger. It's impossible to determine the mutations of that burger. Why do we think the precautionary principle is not uh, to be imposed upon plants and other organisms, even human organoids or aborted fetal t brains that they uh, save uh, in order to do whatever? If you think that that New York issue isn't going along that agenda, they're finding out they need more fetal bodies because of this technology uses the fundamental cells that are still growing. This is the point about Roe versus Wade. I've talked all about this. Before the technology was the Roe versus at the time of Roe versus Wade, they were just looking at whether or not if they took the the fetal unit, which is not a not yet a legal person, the fetal unit would it kill the productive unit in the mo of the mother and as time has passed they've been able to save the mother later and later to the point that now they can save the mother all the way up until seconds before the fetus is born now the industry of roe versus wade for fetal material was created and, and planned parenthood is one of the main agents for that they need more body tissues they need them that young and they put them into your feed and so why aren't we using a precautionary principle on all this when they, Impossible Burger also claims it's sustainable? That's the principle they use. See, the scientific community was outraged at Chinese scientists gene editing baby claims, but now you see a scientist saying, oh, but it can enhance the baby. But we don't know what other impacts there are. Why don't we use the precautionary principle is another tactic in the administrative addressment. You need to set that forward in a comment. Where you, where you use the precautionary principle and other things sustainable, why aren't you n investigating the need for that here? And I think that, that, that comment all by itself might be enough to stop the process in lots of areas. Lots of areas. And that puts the onus on those that are fabricating, uh, well, the experts say, now put come underneath some scrutiny to make their science a lot better than what it is. Actually, maybe have to make it science. So what's the upshot of all this? And they're going to get you prepared. Uh, again, uh, months and months and months ago, uh, it came right on the heels of all this stuff. It's lab-grown meat. You don't think it? You think it's cheap? No. They got to start raising the price so they get to start putting this stuff in your feed system. Uh, and they says, brace yourself. An article came through. A 163% meat tax could be coming. What's well, the tax? The tax is on something uh, that's a harm in the system. Well, if your system goes sustainable and they claim the bo bovine is not uh, sustainable, then you're going to pay a tax because you wanted to eat the meat, and that tax is going to be made in favor of some kind of a subsidy, subsidy to the lab-grown meat so they can continue to make it, the feed, into your system. So when you understand how taxes are supposed to work and why they exist, you can start looking and seeing whether or not they're viable on their face and what they're after. And that's why you see lots of taxes now coming out against you in lots in all areas of your life because the, your life is a crime and they have the government now is in a position to, to mitigate the harm you cause to all society each one of you they don't regard you as a society anymore you're the harm to society so to offset that to your harm you're going to pay a tithe in the form of a tax that extortion of every kind that your civil rights is title 42 usc 1981 for those of you who are doubters and deniers you go look and see those taxes are your civil rights and you're going to be paying because you're the problem by eating meat. And they need to make it more sustainable. So they're going to take, ostensibly, take that tax money and hand it as subsidies to these labs. All right? So that's how that all starts to work. When you see are paying a tax, it means you're doing a harm. You're presumptively a criminal, and you don't even realize that. That's how they justify it as well. And if you have never heard that, then you're not reading quite the right things that you need to be reading to start to see how this thing starts to work and maybe that shows the subtle distinction on how I move this through and how I can see what I see and what it does and uh, things I don't even talk about. I, it just becomes a thought process of the ramifications of this mode and how this works and I have never, I don't think I've ever said that, that definition, maybe one time before I've explained what taxes are about uh, but now if you, in this context you can see how they're done. They, they come at you because you're becoming a harm that you need to be mitigated and the government's there sitting there for you to pay and they are there to regulate you for the harm that you're causing. Under sustainability, all people are the harm in every aspect of your life. You like meat and they don't think it's sustainable, you're going to pay a meat tax until we wean you off of eating that and you're going to be eating that impossible burger. 
And if you die because of the, the, the soy uh, protein concentration, too bad. We don't need you around anyway. You're evidence that it doesn't work. Let's get back to the scientists, so-called, the guys looking at it, the guys that have been pro promoting all this stuff, it, uh, the water under the bridge that we don't bring to the table and say, listen, you, you're not, you got to look at this, and if you don't, you're not meaningfully looking at it, and I can enjoin your process for trying to harm people for not looking at the harm. A GM potato creator now fears its impact on human health. Okay, so this guy makes a living out of doing this stuff, and finally he gets a conscience. But here it is for us. Here's the evidence. It concurs with the other guy that says, oh, we can't, the mutations, oh, they're impossible to predict. Of all the genetic engineers who have renounced the technology, oh, there's more folks. And they give you a list of a few. Arpad Postatia, Belinda Martinier, uh, Thierry Frain, John Fagan, among others. So there's a whole bunch of scientists coming up. If we just knew about them and go find their work, we're going to find out and look inside what they say to see and validate what they what they see as a problem. The same guy that was over there saying, oh, we, oh the mutations, we don't know. We can never predict all that. Uh, will be one of those things you're looking at. Uh, these people, because of its short-sighted approach and ability to produce an unintended and potential toxic consequences. Wow, forgot all about that. It's right there. See, this is a common theme about the failure. This has been my problem oh, for years and years. Like I told you, way back in the 70 or so, when they were, they were first talking about this wondrous genetic technology coming on, I was saying, well, what about the consequences? They didn't have an answer. They still don't have an answer, so they sweep that under the rug. But here it is. Now scientists are coming out. Don't need the guy behind the woodshed to tell you. K.S. Roman's story most uh, may be the most compelling. Romans was a director in research of Simplot uh, Plant Sciences from 2000 to 2013, where he led development of the company's genetically engineered innate potato. But over time, Romans, R-O-M-M-E-N-S, Romans, not Romans, started to have, although... Uh, started to have serious doubts about his work and worried about the potential health risks about eating the GM potatoes, which are now sold in 4,000 supermarkets in the United States. Did you know that, folks? So, I mean, do I really need to keep reading more? But I'll read another, let's read another paragraph. Roman's concern about the GM potato led him to write the book Pandora's Pat Potatoes. When you want to go look this up, which was recently published. The book is a case study on how a scientist's initial enthusiasm about genetic engineering turns to doubt and fear as he realizes the hazards the technology can create. This is a comment, folks. This authority here with that in your, uh, in your uh, appendix is a comment that isn't being looked at. The, they're already putting this stuff in the marketplaces, how far behind you are. And so the scientist finally comes out, has a conscience. You can read, again, I can read this story. The point is we have another scientist saying that these, there's toxic consequences, I'll use his term, to what's going on. And you could sit quiet while these toxic consequences are pushed through a system that you deride, correctly deride, but don't do anything to stop. And I've been coming for years to try and tell you, engage somewhere. Right now we have to engage until we can shut this thing down, find the right an answer to just shut it down. Whether that be us, you know, getting the people knowledgeable to not touch it, whether that gets, becomes legislation that everyone doesn't want to touch because, oh, it's the law, or whatever you were going to have to work out, or the rules get changed. Like I said, go to the policy of the cops to stop the shooting or cause some accountability, or whatever the thing is you're noticing. You have to engage, or one day this stuff happens to you. So GM potatoes, already in the market, the, the guy who designed it, uh, now the, the modifications are fearful. Was the first guy that did the russet potato, was he fearful? No, there's a way to go through this naturally that kind of gets you along. It takes a little bit longer. It's not as profiteering, but it does work. And I've talked to you about my, my experience with all that. My grandfather used to do that, modify food through hybridization over years to make it a better squash, a better way to grow sugar cane, a better this and better that. We never touched the genes. It was all about... about asking the plant to go in the direction that it was better uh, suited for people. It never polluted the environment. 
that never did any of that stuff. And over time, you were able to get better food. But here we have this point. They talk inside uh, the article. I respond here. It's all wrote, written down like on the Twitter. Is this little dialogue, this little his history uh, library. The transparent ripple effect is what I identified in all this. Quote, a silencing taking place in GM potatoes affects genes of animals eating GM potatoes was identified. When you eat this stuff, it affects the animals. What have I been talking about earlier about the administrative process and allowing these animal products, GM modified animal products to go into your feed system? It should be a food system, but it's a feed system. They say in this article that it affects the animals eating the potatoes. What have we said over and over behind a woodshed about this problem forever? I've ever been talking about it. We confirmed more of that in that gut stuff. It affects your gut biota, and that affects your health. So here we have again this quick jump into technology that, oh, sustainable technology is supposed to be the quick fix for profit, and it's again this cherry red button pushing. It's biased and narrow-minded children that are doing this. So if we think we're all grown up and our ex experts are saying that they're responsible people, no, these are, I look at this whole world anymore, I'm sorry, I'm really hard not to see, we're just a bunch of immature idiots at some level. We're biased and narrow-minded on our little focus as children. It's called best science right now, folks. Mon Satan and Slayer and Sin Plot. And DuPont. No, DuPont. DuPont. This is the cover that they've come to hurt you. It's a bunch of children that think they're bigger than that. And I, this is just, that's another microcosm. Like I say, miners are microcosm of certain property things and, and failures and not to move against it and assert their rights and hold fast and just make, keep their property theirs and don't let it be stolen by the government. This is another way. You have people that are educated, or schooled, I should say. They're schooled to believe they're an expert, and they're really just a child mind. And I look, this is what I see just about everywhere. Twitter's that way. It's why you see what's going on. It's insane. It's a bunch of kids. It's like toddlers are, are just higher. I guess I'll say it. I've been just sitting here watching stuff go on everywhere, even in the chat room. It's like a rumpus room. We, we couldn't get together to save ourselves if if it, if we understood well, we can't. I just We can't get together to save ourselves. We're watching destruction on the horizon, and none of us can get together to help each other. And those of us that are trying to do our best are naughty to listen to, derided, derided, listened to with in interest and not followed through or whatever. It's just a fascination to me at one level and a disgust at another, and I don't know what to do about it, so I just keep coming to tell you, let's get off, let's grow up. No data, little known, nobody knows, just conceal was all statements in this article about the GM potato. And this is what is best science. A big excuse to move forward. Why? Because it gives somebody a paycheck somewhere. It gives them a little notoriety. And there's no one ever anywhere to check it. Science is a big cherry red button of political lobbying for profit. And until we figure out there is no science actually at this point, there may be a little bit here and there, but not enough, and not in the areas that, that are affecting us immediately, like our food system. It's a feed system now. I've told you this for years. It's not even a chance. I, just, I, I guess I just bring this stuff forward and say, okay, here's confirmation, folks. It's not hard to see it was coming. It's not hard to see they're going to do it to you. Title 50 told me everything I needed to know. It shocked, I uh, just say, it shocked Clint, Clint Richardson. Because, see, you come at it, good people come at this different than what reality is, and we don't realize that. And, and then we, again, it's that the vision of the stinking abyss. You track it down and you see it, you, you're just blown away at how bad it can be. And it's already been there before you got there. People are astounded. And so, we can allow it, they're, 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 we've been taken down, taken over, it's getting going to get worse. We have people putting, pushing cherry red buttons on no data, little known, nobody knows, just concealed, bias in a narrow-minded, childlike state. And we call that, we exalt that as something good, and the agencies pick it up because what? The bottom line. As I keep telling you about the bottom line. It's We need to interject ourselves in the process. Otherwise, 
uh, well, I don't know. You know, it gets, I just don't see a good, a good response to this. It'll go where it goes, but I don't see it as a good thing. And those of you that have sons and daughters and family and people you care about and love about and want to see them go good in the future, that's done. That's all over. Engineered anti-CRISPR proteins for optogenetic control of CRISPR-Cas9. Stunning, stunning report. When you go through today what I've been talking about, about animal-based processes and GM modification through CRISPR, and you read this optogenetically controlled technology about the genes that they make, and then you remember we talked about the use of light now is coming on to do things. Oh, the Mexican uh, scientist just found out you can cure cancer with a dye. I didn't get to this story. This is a way your genes are made in order they are optogenetically controlled. If you don't think that we're coming on to some interesting times indeed, anti-CRISPR proteins are powerful tools for CRISPR-Cas9 regulation. The ability to precisely modulate their activity could facilitate spatial-temporally confined genome perturbations and uncover fundamental aspects of CRISPR biology. We engineered optogenetic anti-CRISPR variants comprising of hybrids and a, uh, ACR2A4, a potent streptococcus pyogenes Cas9 inhibitor, and the LOV photosensor from Avena sativa, co-expression of these proteins with Casper 9, Casper Cas, Cas9 effectors enabled light-mediated genome and epigenome editing and revealed rapid Cas9 genome targeting in human cells. If you don't think that's showing you that you can walk through a beam of light at some point in the near future and be changed, controlled, switched on, switched off, changed, altered in some regard, uh, you're missing the importance of this little study looking within the tool. And this is the stuff they're putting in your food. I am just fascinated. I mean, one, I'm just excited hearing this kind of depth of, of, of technology that's there. I'm terrified at what it looks like they'll be doing on all, a lot of the other st stories I've read behind the woodshed. All the little optical, optoelectric, optical control things that they did, that they talk about in other places. I said, well, if they put that in your body, watch out. And here, here's the technology that's saying, oh, we do this in the lab. I won't read more. You can read it yourself. It, I mean, part of me is terrified to see in the gene modification techniques, what they understand already, that you, they're clueless. And they throw this out to us so that we'll know that it's there impossible. But what I look at is when I see things like, you know, the binary weapons of the United States government over Title 50 in 1953, where they spray something in the air of the San Francisco Bay Area, and then they have their tr Class B transmitter, the big tele television transmitter, is a special transmitter that activated that, that, that uh, organism. And then I think about this, you know, micro, these uh, radio technology transmissions are just a frequency. Light's just a frequency. This is activated by a higher frequency than what would come off of tra class B is all. We understand now that certain waveforms go right mostly through your body. There's not one cell they couldn't touch. Am I going too sci-fi here? Is this like too much out of reality? I really don't think so. I keep having to say that uh, you don't think... I think about how nuts it sounds, but the technology is here, and they understand it. And there's people out there that understand things, like when you hear that doctor, oh, no, we, I'm work, I've, been, I've been the expert on CCR5. And you know what? It does do that, but you know, elsewise, we can't predict the mutations this is also doing elsewise. We have no way. It's impossible, Burger. That's your brain. That's what's going to go into the human organoid uh, en or, uh, or enzymes and things that are making your food. One day they walk through a beam of light. All you UFO guys, the beam of light comes down and all of a sudden you turn into a frog or something, I guess. A bowl of jelly. Some zombie. Who knows? Your mind goes fry. You aren't yourself the next day. Well, that's what that new uh, inculcation, indoctrination center did to you, didn't they? At any rate, pretty cool technology, terrifying at the same time. And so why do we go there? Because they can. Next generation of warfare genetically engineered viruses. 
this isn't even new news. The point is, is when you connect up all this genetic stuff and these techniques and the tools that do this, you have the ability to trigger. You don't need a way. You don't, 5G, they don't need. They just get a beam of light here. All kinds of different pathways to trigger binary, trinary weapons. I've been telling you about the about these things for for a long time, and I didn't make that up. I got that from the reading the reports that the government's done over years, and the most prevalent to me at the time, because it was like invisible technology, would be a, using a class V transmitter transmitter to activate a biology that would hurt you. In that case, it was simply the flu, and they took reports about it. But getting over to here, next generation of warfare, genetically engineered viruses. What was I just talking about here? The engineering of the Cas9 uh, uh, anti-CRISPR technology to cause optogenetic uh, control. You don't think that's going to be built into these? And the government's, uh, the warfare's, the government, the military's working on it? That's title, that's title 50, folks. I don't know what else to say. It's right here. And up pops this scathing report accuses the Pentagon of developing an agricultural bioweapon. These people don't miss a trick. Your food is very, very important, and they won't, they don't care about testing it to find out whether or not they're going to go after it. They're going to go after your food. That's one of the main, you know, water, food, all your, you know, what, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, it's a reality. This is not no, no unknown. This is not like, oh, they're doing it right now. But when you tie all this with the things that I've talked about today relative to gene modification, it's within the grasp. This is not science fiction future. This is not... Dick Tracy looking at a watch that doesn't exist, that he's doing things with the communicator and all that. No, this is actually in the works, happening. There's people working on things we have no clue that have answers that are not speaking. And you see now that lack of disclosure could interfere with a administrative impos an administrative comment that says, hey, this guy over here says this can happen. You haven't figured that out. You need to go look at that if your body, the body here, this governmental body, is here to regulate for safety, like you say, if it's not a pretense to hurt people. At least we get the, someone goes out there and gets the answer, no, we're here to hurt people. Why? Title 50. Well, that would be a neat awareness. I don't care what the truth is, as long as we're told it. But right now that's not being told, and I think that's a problem. I think that's a problem for people to really get it. We all want to just say, oh, that's not happening. It's uh, too sci-fi. Oh, that can't. Oh, they wouldn't do that to you. Well, go read Title 50. They can, and they were. Look around you. All you people that argue, uh, discuss, or get all feared, uh, feared of chemtrails and all this biological stuff that's going on, you, you all have your chance to get involved with something that really, um, if, if, it, if it violates your senses so bad that you have to, that's all you talk about, you really should be making comments and addressing this thing in a more formal way and working to stop it. You know, we, we talk about chemtrails and chemtrail spraying. Well, they did that in the 30s on that experiment. They they spread a biological around until they infected people. And then weeks later, they turned on the transmitter for a certain amount of times and fired it up. And people got sick. They did it to their own people, folks. You think this is not nuts. So what else do they do? What else do they do to you under the under the uh, efforts that we think is food security, like they told us, sustainable food security. No, I told you that was nonsense, and watch out, and you've seen it, folks. Whether you want to agree to this or not, I told you this is what was going to happen. When I we looked at those modernization bills that came through, there was about five or six of them. One of them was food security. It may have been 2010, 2011. I said, folks, your systems that these bills are touching are going to go down the tubes. And you're watching your food system is doing that. Well, it wasn't. That was when they made it official. Long time this has been going on. This commerce-based profiteering. They don't really care that they harm you. So they don't care to make long-term harm for you. Why? Pharma, chema, all the they the they all make money on your sickness as as much as they would on you being active and going out and doing something. Because as a productive part, you're also going to make other. Um, economies and people profitable. You don't usually go uh, fishing without a boat, or you don't go fishing without a reel. They're going to buy it from somebody, so someone's going to make it, make it on what you think you need. And those are the okay. So 
but you have to eat and you have to do things. We may not have understood that these things are bad for us. We may not have understood that the agencies are willing and able and have had hearings on certain things and allow harm. And I've been here to tell you that all the time. This is what they partly do, and it's this risk management. How many people are going to get hurt versus the profits that can be made? That's, the, how, that's how vaccines work as well. In fact, Japan had a problem. I, may, I don't think I'm going to get to that one, but Japan had the problem with MMR, MMR vaccine. The, the, the risk, 1,700 pe- kids, uh, babies got harmed. They said that risk is too high. We're not going to do those. What we're going to do is we're going to split those MMR, vi- that MMR apart, and we're going to give one at a time like I was telling you, might be possible to do, and over a different time schedule. And and so I won't get into that story, but here, study, daily diet drinks linked to strokes, heart attacks, and early death. Bad news for those who have been chugging diet sodas under the belief that they're healthier than regular sodas. CNN reports that a new study from no less an authority than the American Heart Association says that, quote, drinking two or more of any kind of artificially sweetened drinks a day is linked to an increased risk of clot-based strokes, heart attacks, and early death in women over 50. So, uh, anyway, this is not really a new story uh, either, but this is also in the news. And you understand these artificial sweeteners are typically a GMO-based derivative from, like, E. coli. Aspartame, they said, was like milk and bananas, remember? Well, they were talking about particular two proteins that were in either, but not they aren't milk and bananas. It's this derivative that came from the GMO-modified E. coli, something that comes out of the uh, other end of where this milk and bananas would go. And so these things are found to be causing these problems. They have our adverse impacts. I say the word impact because that's your administrative term. Adverse impacts to their use. And now we finally get the studies where the government could care less could care less. And so we're back to this administrative attack. The government allows it. Title 50 tells me everything I want to know, whether or not anybody else wants to go read there. I am not surprised. I mean, I'm surprised, but I'm not surprised. I'm surprised you all don't respond. I'm surprised you all would rather get fighting amongst yourself and and, and just do immature things than to really look at these things. There's millions and millions, hundreds of millions of us, and we're not really responding. And I and I I'm not the I can't get people to to quite uh, get over the apathy. I don't know. I guess I'm not ever going to be that guy. But I'm not. I can speak continually. Speak. I continually to see how it gets working, how it's not working, what stops things, and that a lot of it's just not an integration with the uh, the invader. We're not in, we're not resisting the invader. If we had a Paul Revere at every door, at every notice, at everything, at every news article about rise up and bring your bring your long rifles it might be a little bit different as i said earlier but i would also then wonder are you really going to you wouldn't get your rifle and go stop it you're too lazy and apathetic and worried about arguing with someone on the keyboard in the chat room and then lincoln told us something else so you know that and the back of your mind oh yeah lincoln told us we can't win and so we give up but we're going to go ahead and start drinking all this feed stuff they give us feed stock we're going to drink all these artificially sweetened, GMO-sweetened materials and not think anything of it. And so we find out it has a direct effect of our, on our body. So when you're going to come in with a comment, you can say, this is what's been happening over, what, 50, 60 years now with these materials, and they cause these problems. And I'm offered you one more point and one problem. They then said that in a risk assessment. So you'd have to come with some of the numbers to say, so this is the numbers that you're talking about will be future effect, impact uh, adversely affected by this, just on this historic data here that hasn't been proven to not happen. In other words, the product of a GMO, a product of a chemistry, uh, has a has a history, and you can you go to that even though there's not a proven uh, position. And if they want to go sustainable, like the government wants to do, as a voluntary thing, remember, this was never brought into law, but they're doing it voluntary. You want to do it sustainably? Let's go ahead and use that precautionary principle. In other words, nothing happens until you prove nothing can happen adversely to us. But you're going to, I can I can talk about that behind Wichita all the time. Until some people get out, all a lot of people get out and start writing comments along those lines and enforce that and persist and keep going and keep pressing until if they ignore it, you press it further to the injunction. 
and let them know you're going to be there. Until we start doing this, we're going to be given feed, and it's going to kill us. And the and the system is going to the system is going to profit from all that. Your life is degraded while they someone profits. Someone's r riding around in jet aircraft and 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 having a good life and doing whatever they think they're having fun, and while you're 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 toiling away at your own injury. So your your time's going to be taken up by somebody. What are you going to focus on? You're going to focus on something that you can stop them from harming you, invading your land, or are you going to not and think you're getting away with it right now and and slowly have your life be miserable? And so again, as I talked about the MMR, maybe a little bit premature. I'll get right to that about what the government allows and what the toxic see these toxic consequences are not being spoken about. Lots of people talking about it outwardly. I'm saying take all this knowledge and turn it into comments written down and sent into the agencies and persist. Our communication about it outwardly, once we know, is a waste of time outwardly. We need to turn it inwardly. St Dr. Stephanie Seneff presents Roundup, MMR, and Autism, a Toxic Connection. So this is getting into the, the trinary type weapon type systems that would look like if you're planning a, to, to attack people. You get three different, three different, really, well, maybe even safe. You could say three safe organ, uh, things that, that then combine in a system that become unsafe is uh, what I saw in this thing regarding the MMR, which we then had uh, right after this, and this was weeks and weeks ago. Uh, this was that back in February, but here just this last week, we now come out that with the report that this is where I was talking about Japan has banned the MMR vaccine, the trivalent vaccine. They're finding that it hurts you. And so here in Japan, they're finding harm. In the United States, they allow it. And if you don't stop and bring this forward, even for your little ones going to school, like in a place like California, it's supposed to be mandatory, and bring this forward, you're going to be subject to whatever they found in Japan. If you did, if you were completely agreeable to get a vaccine, the facts of the Japan response is going to happen to your kids. And that's a, what risk are you going to be to be the one in 1700 or 1700, excuse me, that over the time, the year, I think it was, got hurt, bad hurt. When in fact, when you look and I found that story really important because what they found out is that there was 95 people that got hurt the year after they started splitting apart. And I looked at that and I said, well, that's still a risk that they took, but why don't they go find the 95, go look at those 95 and find what kind of a genetic structure, what kind of a life, investigate those 95 to find those that are affected by the secondary response. In other words, for the most part, apparently the vaccines that when they separate them out, and hopefully they were the right ones, not the one with the pollution in them, which I don't know that you can even filter out. So that's a little different argument. However, let's say, we, we, let's, let's give the science the, 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 the credit, the, the credit here. That they does avoid 95 deaths if you take it. But let's find the 95 that were sick after and find out that's the ones that actually have to maybe uh, be protected, not 100%. Let's work the other way. But see, you do it that way, there's no profit. So the exceptions are really what I've noticed in my life. The absence of something is really can tell you a lot. The, a counter effect can give you a knowledge. In other words, 95 kids, after you separate, there was still a group of 95 kids in the population that were sick. That speaks to me of genetic predisposition that may be very instructive for all of this stuff. So why Japan banned an MMR vaccine is explained for those of you that are into this. And this is not just vaccines. This happens to touch every other thing that an agency would do in agreeing to a um, monop um, industry or corporation request for things that are safe and to make profit from them. And so to me, these are just instruction, instructive that I take and I then apply to other things to look for. In other words, when you find a report coming right out of the FDA that says, hey, there's these people that can't handle this concentrated uh, impossible burger soy protein, that's what you want to look at that. You want to go right into there and see what is going on with those people. Because that may indicate something else that you can find that, that hasn't been discovered yet or can be filtered out. Why you do that? You do that so that you give warning to people. Because this is supposed to be due process. You're supposed to have notice. That's how the limited liability actually works. 
You can do some. I can do something wrong. California. I can put a carcinogenic material in a, in a in a product that, as long as I put that on the label, then I'm fine. You may not be, but that's up to you, isn't it? And when you understand, get your head wrapped around that part, then you start understanding what I'm saying more like the Clean Water Act is not an act of clean water, but an uh, act to pollute water just that much. And why it's uh, how when you lie about the pollution, you get charged and dinged hard. And if you just tell them you polluted, they're okay. Now that we know about it, fine. And when you get your head wrapped around all that, these extremes that go on, maybe you start to start to figure out what I've been saying a little bit on how this all works. I don't think it's ideal. I don't agree with it. It's where we are, though, and this is what's working in the world. This is what your world is. This is how you're you're being destroyed. And then it and then it went sustainable. In other words, they can sustain the destruction of your country. And there's just so much to talk about. I mean, we can go on and on all the areas that happens. But my look at it said, well, okay, I can get overwhelmed by all the extreme of it, all the comprehensive attack. Or I can go find out where's the path this they come through. I'll just I'll just target the path these people come through. In other words, I called it the method back in 2013. There's a way they go about doing this. If I can destroy that or stop it, then they uh, this doesn't come on us. And then there's this other thing, another aspect to it. If you're doing that, if you're like I said, the you know the prairie dogs all looking for the eagle. None of you get taken out because you're all looking always and you know what to look for and how to look and what to do in the moment so that it doesn't happen. And then the eagle decides, is he wasting time on your mound or, or maybe he should go find someone else? Well, if the other mound is doing the same thing, that's going to be one hurting, hungry eagle, isn't it? It's going to go find something else. And so that's part of how this strategy also works. Because the government sits there to cause the harms. It, it, is, the, it, well, the, it is the Delphi technique. It is that. Te it is Hegelian. And not even that. It's even deeper than that. It creates the troubles. It gives us excuse to create the trouble. Look at Title 50 again. This really is a, a pivotal. A, a, reading Title 50 gives you the, the, when you understand what you're looking at, it gives you the, it orients your mind very clearly on what, how, how this thing's situated, and I would hope it then orients you. If you have any tactical, strategic, critical mind, any logical mind, it will start to orient your mind in better ways to look at what we're doing. And, and for me, that was it removes a lot of the confusion. Absolutely. I don't have to make up stories about where I'm at. I just know exactly what the potential is. I work with the worst potential, and if I clear out the worst potential, everything less than that is cleared out as well. So I just focus on, on the most extreme. And speaking of extremes, we the government creates its own uh, the problems that it solves, right? This is what the outcome-based living is all about. That's a sustainable society from the exploitation point. So here we have this interesting story that popped up. To, it was interesting to me, at least. It, it, only in one short context. Return from is is I S I S is I is I, ISIS. American woman, the terrorist, so-called. American woman want American women want out of extremism. Return from is is. American women want out of extremism. This a woman, and this happened in the UK, the woman got her, uh, she has a, a child too, got her UK citizenship stripped from her. There's American women, the same thing. This one came up after the UK uh, stripped the woman of, uh, you think that'd be immodest, but of her own citizenship. Uh, based on her decision to go uh, aid, uh, that they say, aid the terrorist. An American woman joined, uh, now American woman joined the Islamic State, and went to Syria, married three I, uh, is is fighters, and called for attacks on Americans. But now she says she was brainwashed in rejecting extreme, is rejecting extremism, and wants to come back with her child. She says she's willing to face justice here in the United States, but should not, but, sh but should she be allowed to come home? Well, Trump has already weighed in and said, don't, told Pompeo, she's not coming home. Now, how is that justice, first of all, in a country that's supposed to say that it's recidivism, if it can stop that, it's, that's justice, and we can let the people back in to society after they've paid a penalty? You're not seeing any of that here. But, but more insidious, how is she, how brainwashed is she? She says she's willing to face justice here in the U.S. The United States caused the problem. How insidious is this mind control that she believes she's coming back to the 
United States to get justice. It's the one that caused the problem and is in denial of it. And her problem is your problem. The United States causes all this against us, and we want to make justice. We want to face what we want to face. We will face what we have to face in order to continue to live here. Never really pointing out that the perpetrator is the one that needs to be taken control of and stopped. Now, I'm not into the terrorism and saying this woman shouldn't look at something, but she was propagandized to by the elements of the things allowed by the government on a condition that the government fomented, created, worked out, fomented. We see all the history now. In fact, 911 starts the whole thing, but brings into an injustice in her mind. She decides, uh, you know, and we look, oh, she gets married to three is his fighters. Well, she got married to one two eight days later. The next guy's dead. She's marrying somebody else. Why? Because they're going to shoot her if she doesn't also. Totally oblivious to the reality of realities. But she's inside something that the United States caused. How can the United States provide justice in that? And I'm looking at a woman who, whatever, I don't know, maybe she did, didn't do, whatever. She's in her mind thinking she can come back to the perpetrator and get justice. And you see the perpetrator not giving anything. No, no, you're not coming back. Even whether it's supposed to be the face of of uh, justice, it's supposed to be the face of righteousness, if you will. It's supposed to be the face of uh, turning the other cheek, all these other Christian values everyone wants to poo-poo that were pretty good to have for people. Give people a chance, unless they can be shown to be the most vile and not, not changeable. That's the ones you put away because you just can't trust them to be anywhere to not do harm. But there's no... Why would she be coming to face face justice against in the face of the same type of terrorist that she went over to support that she didn't know until she got there. The United States is a terrorist. It's the war of terror, not the war on terror. You, my dear listeners, are enemy combatants. If you don't need any, I don't know how you need any more evidence of all this. This is the war powers working out in your face. They don't care whether they harm you. You're going to care whether they harm you. And even in the uh, occupation, there's due process. You see that right in the Libra Code. And I was just informed by a friend of mine that they're seeing that people are talking about this point, that we're in martial law. Whenever it says, well, wait, martial law is coming, they're saying, we're in martial law, go read the Libra Code. I have to put a little bit of a smile on my face. For as little as I get out, I must be getting out. Because this is the condition that has to be getting in mount people's minds. Forget about the coming of martial law. You're in it. Now, what are you going to do about it? But even inside that, Libra Code tells you you have options. So you put yourself and reduce yourself to the least amount of wiggle room, and you start functioning from there, and you're going to find yourself able to wiggle, aren't you, instead of what you're doing. But what you're wiggling is against the oppression. And when you can free you the bindings pretty quickly once you start seeing this the way I've been trying to explain it to you. Uh, and uh, so we have a, I just want to, I looked at this American woman wants to uh, face justice in the United States, and she's going to the terrorist in order to do that. Someone who's duped by the terrorist wants to go back to the terrorist. Isn't that like the Stockholm Syndrome? This is society, folks. We're all, in a way, like that. Mapping the American War on Terror was another story I found fascinating right after the one I read there from Common Dreams. Let me fix something for them in their title, and I'll move on. Mapping the American War of Terror. How's that? Just fixed it. Now we go on. Now we can talk about it. The American War of Terror. The American, the United States, U.S. government is a terrorist. And until we come to terms with that, and when, and then they work under the war necessities. Until you come to terms with that, you won't understand what you're up against. You'll complain about it. You'll see it's wrong. You'll sense it's wrong, but you won't understand, firstly, uh, how it's actually wrong. You'll make up all your stories and mythologies, all your utopias, but you won't address it. And we're required to throw the occupier out, even if it becomes our own, our own government. How do we know that? Our own government. Yes, I said that. Our own government. How do we know that? Because free men in the world on the Declaration of Independence had to throw out the last our government. And the Second Amendment, even though it came a year later, says that's going to happen again. And we're going to, you as a government are going to have to recognize we have the right to defend ourselves. And so we're at war with that government. And they, they 
like you change this uh, grizzle stuff that you turn into a pink slime that we're going to call it ground beef. They've taken the war of terror against the world and made it the war on terror. And I've talked about the Libra Code and how all that works, and there's limitations even within that context. And here we have another story. All this stuff is right here to tell us if we, I guess, have the eyes to he see, the ears to hear, or vice versa, I suppose. Your ears might be able to see light. I don't know. But uh, especially well when you get those those uh, CRISPR, anti-CRISPR adjusted uh, optical, gen optogenetic uh, cells in your hearing sense, they can turn it on by shining a, leer, an eye, an, a light down in your, maybe your doctor turns you on or turns you off in the future. A U.S. Supreme Court, even underneath the rule of war, uh, United Supreme Court rules, the limits that, to limit states' ability to seize property and impose fines. So even within the war and the, and the, and the, and the, 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 the um, uh, seizures that they make, that we talked about here weeks ago and, and on and on, the United States Supreme Court ruled unanimously on Wednesday that the excessive fines clause of the 18th Amendment applies to state and local governments. Announced in an opinion written by Judy, uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, no, she's not dead, and no, they're not hiding her body. On the, uh, so Trump could stop asking, get on the business, I suppose. Ginsburg, on her second day, went uh, to the bench following a December cancer surgery. The ruling limits states' ability to seize property and imposes fines deemed excessive on citizens who break the law. This is really immense. But even under the context of an occupying force underneath the laws of war, there is a limit. And I read that to you when I read all those sections to you. So this is really not a surprise. Now, you would think this wouldn't even be a question. You'd think that the states, for those of you who think states' rights is the answer, you think they would limit it and be reasonable, and they wouldn't be punitive. No, this is the whole point. I want to beat you down. You don't live in the country you thought that you were. The, the Lincoln made that change for everybody. They called it good because it kept the union. Now, keeping cohesiveness may have been a good idea, but the way they kept it was under military control, or so much as you don't see the military control. And then they made the war on drugs. That They took it and they said, oh, we can steal everything. Well, this court case that went through, the Supreme Court just said, no, wait a minute. Now, you just, you have a certain penalty. You can't take their car, their house, their this, their that, if the charges are only for 300 bucks or 400 bucks or whatever, $1,000. You can't do that. That's not within the context of this of the notice that these people are living under underneath your thumb. And so this, I don't even know how this became a question, but this is what your states' rights people, the states will do this to you. And the Supreme Court still has apparently this power to identify the excess of the military because that's an admiralty search and seizure if you understand the power here. That's exclusive to the federal government. So the locals can't do beyond what the constraint of the admiral is, which is also under a constitution. You see that in the Libra Code. Go read it. And so I don't know what more to say. I mean, it's right here. The limits are here. Until you go and do the right argument, until you argue, until you present yourself to make the proper argument, not the petition argument, but the correct position, the meaningful comment, the meaningful assertion, the meaningful understanding that allows to come to the proof about that, we're going to live under the jackboot, left or right, of either bird, wing of the bird of prey, Democrat or Republican, until we throw all this off. And yet there's a laws here that still are in function, even under the most constrained condition, and I would call that to be, if you will, the martial rule, martial law, uh, not constitutional stuff like we see the agenda I keep talking to you about is running roughshod over your light under, under an alternative dispute, con, uh, alternative dispute resolution, consensus-based outcomes. So, it's all addressable if you would just step up. And I'm asking all of us to do that. We're going to need to. Otherwise, this thing goes the way the uh, people have ripped the, ripped the car off and they're going to drive it over a cliff. They're going to jump out right before they let us go over. Thank you for being here listening to me today. Grimner, thank you for what you do at reallibertymedia.com. Folks, I uh, didn't do it again. We have last little bit to, for donations for this month, the, la the only time we do it, uh, to, to put it so, uh, on and through for the extra hardware that might break down through the year and uh, keep Gar Gr Grimner in the kitchen, so to speak, and uh, appreciate everybody who shares and follows and likes and uh, what it passes the information around in the broadcast, UCY.TV. Uh, thank you, Gr uh, Jules, uh, for what you do there and the, simulcasting this broadcast. And I'll be with you next week, Tech Diffs or Nature Willing. Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, 
This is Hal Anthony. Till next time, Journey with Purpose. A can of whoop ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop ass.